Good evening, everyone. Today is May 6, 2021. I call this committee of the whole meeting to order. All counselors are present today via Zoom with the exception of Councillor Davis, who is excused. Um, there's a couple of uh, other counselors, Gibson and Harris, who will be joining us shortly. Uh, before we get started with our moment of silence, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, Councillor Bet Borrego, we are, I am traveling, I'm not driving, my husband's driving, but Councillor Borrego, if I lose reception, will be uh, takeover chair in the meeting. So with that, we will start with a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by um, President Borrego. Did you get that, Pres President Borrego? Yes, thank you, okay, Councilor Pena, you. Council Chair. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Would you like me to do the other one? Yes, please, thank you. Juramento a la bandera Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la República que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Thank you, Madam President. Um, with that, as posted on our website and noted on the agenda, this meeting has special procedures and is being held via Zoom video conference. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting through four different platforms, GovTV on Comcast Channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. These live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, and or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the closed captioning services on your television or device at this time. For those watching, thank you for joining us. The video recording of this meeting will also remain available for viewing at any time on the council's um, city council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 768-3100 for assistance during business hours, which are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Today is the second of three public hearings the council is required to hold on the city's budget, uh, operating budget. Today's meeting will focus on the physical goals budget, which include animal welfare, aviation, environmental health, finance and administration services, legal, DMD, planning, solid waste, DTI, and transit. The council will hold a third committee of the whole meeting on Thursday, May 13th to consider amendments or floor substitutes. No live public comment will be taken at the May 13th meeting, although written comments will be accepted. At the end of the May 13th meeting, the budget as amended or substitute, substituted will be sent to the Monday, May 17th council meeting for adoption. Live public comment will be accepted at that meeting on May 17th. We will now move on to public comment. We have no one signed up to address the committee of a whole, the whole for live public comment today. However, um, you have all received um, and were provided to the councillors uh, written comments. We will now go on to Mr. Lawrence Davis, budget officer. He will give a presentation on physical goal departments. Councillors will have an opportunity to ask questions of each, each department after they are presented. And Mr. Davis, and Mr. Davis, before you get started, I just want um, you to know that um, Actually, the counselors have each individually met with um, our council staff and been briefed very thoroughly. So, um, if there's any parts of the presentation that you um, feel that may be more than thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't catch. Uh... Some of that, Madam Chair, but I, I'm sure we can meet with uh, council staff to get an update. So you can proceed. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Didn't know if we lost service. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As you stated, this is the uh, physical goals for the fiscal year 22 proposed budget. 
Um, we will cover legal, technology, and innovation, animal welfare, environmental health, finance and administrative services, human resources, municipal development, Office of Inspector General, Office of Internal Audit, Planning, Aviation, Solid Waste, and finally, uh, Transit. And uh, Madam Chair, this will flow the same as the social goals presentation. I will uh, give an overview of the budget, um, FTE, and each director has a, a presentation or a few slides to go over after that. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, we'll start off with legal. Uh, legal, uh, Esteban Aguilar, city attorney, uh, fiscal year 22 proposed general fund budget of $7.9 million, 69 general fund positions, operating grants fund 265, $645,000, and this supports two grant funded positions. The proposed budget includes 64,000 in paralegal wage increases to ensure that it has adequate support uh, staff to assist attorneys and continue its reduced reliance on outside counsel payments. And there's a slide that goes into more detail in, in uh, the next slide with uh, city attorney, uh, Steve Aguilar. Uh, next is 141,000 is included to further develop the CFPI office by adding one manager position. Uh, next is 123,000 uh, is included to expand the office of civil rights by adding a new assistant attorney position. 30,000 will fully fund the bank on outreach manager position. And finally, 97,000 will be used to hire a communication and public information officer within the Office of Equity and Inclusion. With that, I believe uh, City Attorney Aguilar is on and I will go to the next slide if there are no questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Pena and members of the council. We appreciate the opportunity to be able to present to you today. Uh, as uh, as uh, uh, Director Davis had mentioned, uh, one of our goals starting three years ago was, was really reinvesting in the legal department and, and transforming it into a uh, fully functional law firm. And, and that starts by prioritizing our investment in, our, in the talent that we have uh, to recruit and retain uh, existing talent and, and talent outside of the department to fill critical needs. Um, our, one of our main priorities that we have discussed is reducing or eliminating uh, the amount of risk or uh, taxpayer dollars that are being sent to outside firms to handle matters that the department should be handling on its own. And the slide reflects uh, the, the significant reduction in those expenditures um, starting from, you can see the, the amount that we had paid in, in fiscal year 17, uh, nearly one and a half million and steadily over the last three cycles, we have uh, eliminated that the amount of overall uh, funding that has been spent to outside council payments. Uh, we've reduced it down to this, this fiscal year is $852,000. Um, that does not reflect uh, or that the COVID pandemic did not impact our the amount of work that the uh, city attorney's office is receiving or the amount of claims that have been coming in. So um, we're, we're very proud of our team and, and the work that we have done. And that's what this slide reflects. Um, next slide, please. Some of the accomplishments that we, that we have made over the last year. Um, we'll start with the Consumer Financial Protection Initiative, uh, which has been headed by Karen Myers. The, the FPI uh, office was established uh, this fiscal year for the city of Albuquerque. Uh, in addition, the office did develop and deliver a solar awareness campaign, um, has developed along with, with several of our partners, a financial navigators program. Um, the office has delivered uh, consumer education regarding scams, form of the scam squad. Um, they provided support and assistance on COVID related issues. Uh, as well as developing um, the framework for uh, consumer protections. Um, the office specifically helped and provided assistance to the city's and our community's response regarding eviction prevention and tenants' rights in response to that pandemic. The Office of Civil Rights, which is headed by Tori Jacobus, works to protect the community by prohibiting discrimination in areas of housing, public accommodation, and employment by providing a mechanism for recourse and providing education to the community. Several key 
accomplishments have been the legislative advocacy on civil rights issues at both the municipal and the state level, as well as chairing uh, the Domestic Violence Task Force. Uh, with that, I will turn over the uh, presentation to Director Melendez, Melendez, who should be on standby. I Director. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Sorry, okay. Uh, thank you. I wanted to share with you that this past year, we really, really used data to help our entire city direct all of our COVID efforts to those communities that are the most vulnerable. And this is a slide that shows our COVID data dashboard. We collaborated with the Environmental Health Department, with the New Mexico Department of Health and uh, other departments to look at our case rate data by zip code and by sub county level to help direct our resources and our outreach and enforcement efforts to those areas that were experiencing really high cases. And we've subsequently used that same data to help our city direct resources such as our food and our rental assistance and where we should put Wi-Fi uh, based on data that shows where the most vulnerable were living and where those services would be the needed the most. And that's one of the biggest um, accomplishments of our office in this past year. We continue to use this data dashboard to help direct the city's recovery efforts as well. And if you could go to the next, thank you. Um, the other one thing that I wanted to really point out that we're very proud of is our city's efforts to rapidly accelerate and expand our language access throughout the city. So before the Office of Equity and Inclusion really existed, we had APD and Environmental Health and Planning Department using language services very well. And when we came in, we helped increase their use of local language service providers, as well as worked with Family and Community Services, Aviation, Department of Senior Affairs, Transit, and the Albuquerque Fire Department so that they could begin to use language access services, as well as our colleagues in the legal department. We translated all of the civil rights information into five languages and have continued to translate much of the consumer and financial affairs, scam alerts and notices to the public about financial navigators and rental assistance and what people need to do to avoid eviction. Um, those are some of the examples of the kinds of things that our office has made sure that we're putting into various languages so that all of our community has access to those vital, vital resources. And some of the things that you would have seen and that you've actually participated in is holding bilingual town halls that were unheard of before this administration, thanks to Councillor Senna and our mayor started bilingual town halls and bilingual briefings for members of the community so that they would get that COVID information and other information in the languages that they speak in a timely manner. A couple of other major accomplishments this last year were training nearly 1,000 city employees and community members in the principles and practices and use of data and tools for equity and inclusion. And this is a training similar to what you all received as city councilors last December, plus additional trainings out of 20 different webinars that we give on a monthly basis. And this includes training the APD cadets. Every cadet class since this administration took office has gotten cultural competency training through community organizations that we bring to the academy to introduce to the cadets and help to build those relationships with those community organizations and APD. And most recently, the APD ambassadors got that same training so that they can really start to develop their relationships with those populations in our city. And then finally, I would uh, give you a short update on where we are with regard to implementing the legislation that you all passed this past year. 
you passed R2075, which really reaffirmed our city's commitment to equity and inclusion, and R2085 that embeds that racial equity criterion into the CIP process. And so we have begun training department equity liaisons on how to use the different, um, excuse me, the different tools and data sets and the maps that we provided so that their leaders in their department can start to set equity goals and action plans for their departments as called for in R2075. I think that's the last one. Okay, and the 97,000 that we're requesting for a communications and public information officer, that person will be employed in our office, but they serve multiple offices. They also serve civil rights and consumer and financial protection. And again, this is how we get the word out through many, many channels, through newsletters, direct communication, as well as social media and news releases and our website about all of those resources and the language services that we provide, as well as the scam alerts and um, notices that we would be putting out for consumer and financial protection and for civil rights, as well as our office. And I'll take any questions that you may have and I thank you for your attention. Similarly as well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Pena and members of the council. And I am also happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you. Are there any um, questions from the counselors? If, if Council not, Pena? yes. Um, I wanted Madam to President. ask uh, Director Melendres a question. If she could scroll back to the map that she provided. Um, I, that map is very helpful, Director Melendres, um, so that we can see where there are gaps. Um, my question is with regard to um, when you did the scan, did you find that, um, and I guess the, the areas that, that um, show a higher need are, are in purple, is that right? No, this one is just a, a snapshot of the, of the dashboard itself. It's not an interactive map for this particular PowerPoint. And actually our resources are going all over the city and so is the need. It's, it's really spread out all over the city. So what we learned by, by mapping it is that we were doing a pretty good job as a city of covering the need, um, covering it in high, poverty areas, but also in other parts of the city that are not necessarily as high poverty, but when they were experiencing evictions or the need for rental assistance, that was getting to them as well. So I guess my question is, um, does, does this map or do you have another map that shows areas where you have uh, multifamily um, apartments and so that maybe there's a higher need and there was a higher need in some of those areas. Do you have that? Yes, absolutely. We have a, a series of pretty extensive maps that show all the multifamily housing, as well as which of them has experienced high eviction rates. And we've used that to do some direct education and outreach, sending flyers to those property owners, notifying them of the resources available. Could you share those maps with my office, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Melendez and um, Mr. Aguilar and all the staff from this department, I just wanna say that I think that you've done an extraordinary job this year with how you've revamped the, the uh, legal office and, and really um, talking about equity and inclusion. I think this has been the year that not only because of the pandemic, but because, you know, I, I really believe that, you know, people have really put an emphasis on making sure that, that we address equity. And I think that um, uh, this past year has been a prime example of that. So thank you, Ms. Melendez and, and Mr. Aguilar and everyone in your office. I really appreciate you. With that, Mr. Davis, I don't see any other questions, um, hands raised. So with that, we will move on, um, Mr. Davis, to your next presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, we have Technology and Innovation. Brian Osterlow is the director. Uh, fiscal year 22 proposed budget of 16.9 million 
127 general fund positions. We also have the communications fund at 11.1 million, 18 positions. Uh, the proposed budget includes CIP coming online uh, for funding of 320,000 for annual information system maintenance costs. Uh, we also have the communication fund is decreased by 1.5 million uh, as funding for the voiceover IP debt service is complete and the transfer to debt service, it, the debt service fund is eliminated. And you saw that in most of the CAO summaries and there was various questions about why we were taking away uh, voiceover IP, but this is the reason the debt service is completely paid off. And Director Osterlo does have uh, a few slides. Thank you all very much. Uh, I, I just wanted to provide an update overview on uh, what we have done, especially in the past year. Expansion specifically in, in terms of public Wi-Fi. Uh, the map in front of you now shows 69 locations. Um, they are spread throughout the city. Not all of those are um, um, Wi-Fi at city facilities. It's a mix of things. You can, as you can see, summer meal sites, Wi-Fi on wheels. Wi-Fi on wheels was when we uh, uh, put Wi-Fi on school buses or sun vans or vehicles and parked them outside of um, uh, schools after they closed. Uh, we did expand our own city Wi-Fi, putting Wi-Fi outside city facilities and uh, are now working on parks in 28 different locations. We are also very pleased with uh, what's happened so far with uh, Albuquerque Housing Authority locations. We have it at eight locations and they are some of the highest traffic locations that we have. We have another three mobile Wi-Fi that we can move um, for various purposes and seven Bernalillo County sites. Uh, I was asked when I first showed this map, well, what are the things outside uh, Albuquerque so far? So we have some, for example, in the lower Southwest, Pajarito Mesa, we put out uh, Wi-Fi on wheels out of Pajarito, Pajarito Mesa so that we could uh, assist with students who couldn't go into school at that time. There's some on the East Mountains. There are a couple at uh, um, uh, the library we have over in the East Mountains. And then we also did um, similar up at the Corrales Library. Not all of those are currently being used. Schools have come back in, um, but the majority are still, are, are still in use. If we can go to the next slide. Um, we, we've done this a lot on our own, but not anywhere near, um, we wouldn't be anywhere near that extent without our partners. We worked very closely with APS over the last year to, to determine where are the starting points to learn, um, learn more about where should we try to put the Wi-Fi, where are we going to get the use? Of course, working with Albuquerque Housing Authority, we um, have a partnership with Comcast. They're helping us with some indoor uh, public Wi-Fi at some of the community centers or some other facilities where we don't currently have it. So they supply the, the bandwidth and they supply the equipment at no cost to the city. And it gives free public Wi-Fi to a greater extent so we don't have to expend our resources. UNM and CNM have both been uh, uh, critical partners. At the height of the pandemic, they opened up their parking lots where they had Wi-Fi so that uh, students and others could go into those parking lots and catch a signal. Um, we've been in conversations and continue to be in conversation with the state of New Mexico. We've, uh, we've worked with Vista volunteers. We've done this with an eye towards as much inclusion as we possibly can. We have videos in five languages. We have flyers in seven languages. Um, one of the very early lessons, this is not surprising, but, um, it had to be dealt with. If you don't tell people it's there, they don't know. Not a, not a real surprise. So we've made yard signs. We put out yard signs outside city facilities, made a big difference, of course. Analog marketing, we have on-site at those locations. We actually are in the buses as well. Um, one of the, I thought, clever uh, clever ways of, of marketing this was get into laundromats, get into laundry facilities especially in areas where there might be, as, as Councilor Borrego, you spoke of, multifamily um, housing units. Uh, so we get into the laundry facilities with information in there. And that uh, it's another, I thought, very clever way of getting to the people where they are. And then again, at grocery and convenience stores. So we're very proud of this effort. We continue to examine. We're, uh, we're now processing, looking at what areas have lower usage, trying to determine why? Is it something we need to do better? Is it just an area where there's less demand? How do we maximize uh, our efforts? And then um, 
of course, through our through our collaboration with the state of New Mexico as the broadband office comes online and watching federal um, federal efforts and federal funding opportunities, uh, we intend to keep expanding this program. So I'll stand for any questions at this point. Are there any questions? Seeing I none. A, I have a oh. comment, Councilor Pena, I'm sorry. Madam um, President. Mr. Osterlich, I just wanna thank you for adding that additional uh, Wi-Fi uh, mobile Wi-Fi in my in my district that I requested uh, in the area of, of uh, Volcano Vista and uh, kind of an area that was sort of a pocket of um, a gap. So I appreciate your working to do that. And Council Brego, you're very welcome. Thank you for bringing it to our to our attention. Um, it is starting to pick up. In usage out there. Uh, last week we had over 250 uh, users. Now some of them may have been multi days. You know, count if I had logged on each day, I would get counted as five users. But over 250 users out there, we're very pleased with that and with the traffic's going through there. So thank you for letting us know about that area. We were pleased to to be able to help. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all your work and making sure that we get the information out there. I know um, lots of people from the community where I live. I just happen to have neighbors who always knock on my door when they have questions. And um, um, I live close to Alamosa uh, School. So there's lots of community members there that I'm sure are part of your 250. So <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Davis, if we could move on to Adam. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Next up is Animal Welfare. Uh, Carolyn Ortega, Director, Fiscal Year 22 proposed general fund budget of 13.9 million, 148 general fund positions. Uh, the proposed budget includes uh, 21 mid-year creation of four positions at a total of 267,000 and the elimination of two positions at a savings of 251,000, basically nets to zero. Uh, in addition, we have 750,000 uh, to support uh, veterinarian clinic vouchers for the public safety spay and neuter program. Next, we have 127,000 that will support a veterinarian clinic assistance and operations for the kennel cough treatment building, uh, kennel Q that starts operating in fiscal year 22. And finally, we have 80,000 that will fund operational costs for the mobile clinic that is coming online. And Director Ortega does have uh, two slides. Thank you, Lawrence, and um, thank you, Madam Chair and Councilors. It's nice to see you. Um, during the animal welfare really thrived during the pandemic, and we had some major achievements in spite of COVID-19. I think that one of the biggest achievements was our foster program. We were able to foster out um, between March 2020, which is the beginning of COVID, through today, um, 1,863 foster, um, fosters, and um, from those fosters, we adopted out 1,412. So that's 76% of our total fosters became adoptions. That's, that's amazing. I mean, I think that really um, helped us to keep our numbers down. As you can see, the small graph to the right uh, basically gives our, our current shelter numbers and foster numbers. So currently we have in the shelter 487 pets. In foster, we have 477 pets. 49% of our overall numbers in our system for pets are in, the, are in foster homes. That just gives a great opportunity for fosters to be adopted and also to be prepared for adoption. Uh, so for us, that was a, a great achievement this year. Now our intakes and outcomes down at, on the graph at the bottom. Um, as you can see at the beginning of COVID, we had a huge push to get pets out of the door um, because we really were uncertain of how, um, how the shelter would remain open. So the community really stepped up and you can see the big, the big push um, out the door with the numbers uh, being really much higher in March in, in the March timeframe of 2020 than any of the other months uh, and adoptions. Now, 
April. Um, we've kind of pulled back our services to the community um, as we understood what we were facing. Um, but every month thereafter has continued to grow. And we've really, by using the hybrid model of, of appointments in the intake area and the virtual line in the adoption area, we've really been able to maintain the population. And it's been pretty consistent. Uh, those that are coming in are going out. And um, so we've really been able to keep our numbers low um, and under 500 during the entire pandemic. Um, so that's a, a huge benefit for our animals. And um, we hope to continue to take advantage of the foster program because it, because it really is beneficial to the, the pets overall. Now our next slide, actually um, couldn't have been better. Um, you see the, the pie chart to the left. This is a representation of our spay and neuter voucher program. Um, for me, equity is very important. So we really try to be strategic on where our mobile adoption, uh, where our mobile um, services unit went out into the four quadrants of Albuquerque. Um, but we really wanted to make sure that the east side and the west side were getting equal exposure and equal services. And obviously we achieved that. 50% um, of our spay and neuter vouchers were issued on the west side and 50% of our spay and neuter vouchers were issued on the east side. Um, which is to me a huge success. Um, on the right there, you can see our mobile care, mo our unit also provided many vaccinations. Uh, our rabies vaccinations were 571, our booster vaccinations 462. We implanted 308 microchips, which really allows us to find those owners when we get the strays into the shelter. Um, and then our spay and neuter voucher count we issued 1,049 uh, spay and neuter vouchers out into the community. And that's just in a span of about four months. So that, spay, that mobile unit was a great success by utilizing the drive-through method. We were able to provide a, a service under four minutes. Um, so we really have exceeded our goals in that area. Um, we just rolled out um, our second season of the We Care mobile unit into the community um, about a month ago. And as you can see to date, the graph on the bottom really shows that although we focused on four quadrants, we hit every single zip code in the city with a service. So that, again, very exciting for us. Um, we really were trying to be strategic and, and we really feel like it was a huge success. Um, I'm glad that Director Osterlo went right before me because um, I have a special thank you for him. He was able, his amazing team was able to get a, um, to get our lottery system set up um, so that community members could actually get into the lottery system that qualify for some of these services and it launched about three weeks ago. And so far we have 900 pets registered for these services. So it does really show, you know, numbers, numbers tell a story and it really does show that there's a huge need for this kind of service in the community. And um, now with, with our budget um, that we're requesting, we really feel like we can deliver on that, on those needs. Um, and the $750,000 that we're requesting will cover about 5,000 spay and neuter vouchers. The 80,000 that we're requesting will allow us to continue to provide these vaccines through our We Care mobile unit. Um, so I really appreciate um, the consideration in this. Um, we're excited to continue to grow these programs and I'll stand for any questions. Are there any questions for Director Ortega? Ortega? Uh, Madam Chair. Councilor Benton. Councilor Benton followed by Councilor Gibson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Director Ortega, a couple of questions. Um, one is um, our staff noted in their write-up that um, 
didn't get to it here. I'm sorry. That the um, um, the number of kennel keepers has reduced has been reduced both last year and proposed this year. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think that's what we're here for. So I will. And I'll ask. You know. Uh, it, is that affecting the adaptability of the average animal if if they're not getting that kind of uh, I know that the, the intent of that is the kennel keepers kind of just take care of the kennels, but that that frees up more time for other staff to help with with training and, uh, uh, you know, behavioral help for the animals. It during this time, it has not, um, because of course we've been able to manage our our population. So um, we are going to be hiring many more um, kennel staff. Um, we do have some shortages, but we also have really taken advantage of our our um, animal counselors as well that have been part of the team uh, during COVID. So we've really fully utilized all of our staff and really. Um, spread our resources around. It, it really was all hands on deck as we continue to move forward. And, and uh, we've never really closed. So we've continued to provide the services. Um, we've just had many more phases than some of the other departments have um, with every couple of weeks kind of um, reopening to another level. So as, as we start to bring in more of the staff that we um, are short right now, um, we do have many positions open. Um, we uh, just interviewed about eight new positions, so we should see those coming online pretty quickly to cover some of those shortfalls. But uh, no, I think um, we have been really strategic and, and also done some operational and organizational chart changes to be more efficient. Okay, thank you. And Madam Chair, just one other question. Uh, I guess, or maybe it's an observation, you know, when you showed the, the pie chart with 50% east and 50% west, I thought, hold it. There's six council districts on the east side and three on the west. <laughs> you know, is there a higher demand for animal welfare uh, 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 or spay and neuter, neuter specifically? That's what that was about. On the west side than the east side? There. There is, I mean, you can see that the 87121 zip code is probably one of the largest zip codes in the city um, and had the, the highest need. Um, mm -hmm. But our, our boundary was basically the river. So you were included on the east side, of course. <laughs> um, so um, yes, the, the 87121 probably put the west side over that limit. But at the end of the day, it was really a a 50-50 need and there's really pockets of poverty in the whole city that we're able to take advantage of this service. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And and yeah, my point is like equity as opposed to equality is probably the, the better gauge, you know, of, of uh, I don't know how to, how to just, I, I think it's an odd pie chart. Just, that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, like too. what's, what's east or west of the river is immaterial uh, to the city as a whole. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Councillor Benton's first question was my question as well. But I, I wasn't getting a lot of clarity, or as much clarity, I guess, as what I need uh, from your your response, director. So I, I understand that you're adding eight more positions, and I'm sure they're needed positions. Um, but at the same time, we're we're diminishing the number of positions of kennel keepers, and. Um, uh, from what I understand, maybe you can correct me on this, but from what I understand that they are, you know, um, interacting with the animals, uh, dogs in particular, um, uh, as much if not more than anybody else or more than probably uh, many of the others, most of the other positions there. Uh, and I, you know, that does seem to me to be really, really important to socialization of, of animals and um, particularly while they're, they're uh, uh, 
you know, in the, uh, in, you know, as long as they are sheltered in particular to have uh, interaction. So it does concern me that we're cutting back on, on uh, uh, kennel keepers. Uh, but then you said that, that uh, you would be hiring more later on. So, we and does that mean after this, this, this uh, 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 2022 budget is, is, is finished or before? Yeah. 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 Madam, Madam Chair and Councillor Gibson, um, we will actually be filling all of our vacant positions, which is, is currently 10 positions that are vacant. Um, we will be filling all of our um, animal, our adoption counselor positions that really help with the, um, the counseling of the community and of the pets. And one of the positions that we're actually adding that I think will, will help to um, um, really work with the animals um, is a behaviorist. We'll be adding another behaviorist to our team that really works closely with preparing planning for the, for the pets um, that have either behavior, emotional issues. Um, so I think that that will really help us to um, get our pets to a, another level. And, and that's really an area that we've, we've had some major, major shortages in. I think as far as the kennel staff, we're, um, we're, we're doing pretty well. Once we're full, at full capacity. Okay, so do you, let me just ask you this. How many positions are you eliminating of zookeepers or zookeepers, um, kennel keepers? One. Just one? Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. How many do you have altogether? I'll have to get back to you on that, Councillor Gibson. Okay. Like more than 20? More than 20. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Borrego. Um, Ms. Ortega, I just want to say thank you for the work that you do. I know um, it's really difficult work and it's emotional work um, and it is for your staff as well. And I know that during COVID, I saw that there was an, an increase in people who surrendered their pets. Um, so, you know, I know, and I was just reading an article, uh, I think it was day before yesterday about um, a, a kitten or a cat that, um, that ended up dying and sort of all of the difficulty that it went through. You didn't discuss any of, um, of the times and the, the time spent um, in legal cases that you are, are involved with. And I know that that has to also take some of your time. Um, but I just wanna thank you for, for you know, the work that you do for our four-legged kids. I mean, because, um, you know, they have helped a lot of people get through COVID. And um, I know that some people probably not, I mean, almost not willingly have had to give up their pets because it was a matter of, you know, where they were spending their money. Um, so I, I'm, I'll be watching to see how many you adopt out and trying to help as much as possible. So just please let me know if I, if there's anything I can do to help you adopt out those, those animals. Thank you so much, Councillor Borrego. Thank you, Madam President. And I just will finish that because I don't see any uh, other raised hands, but I just want to thank you, Director Ortega, for all the work you do. Um, if anyone knows me, they know that I've never owned a pet in my life, or much less an indoor pet. Um, actually, my husband has a couple of dogs, but um, you know, I, I'm watching Councillor Senna always picking up dogs on every street corner and taking them to the shelter and all the work she does. I've just kind of decided that it's probably time to get a to get a rescue. And we went in and your staff was just excellent. And the entire process was wonderful. And I appreciate all the work and just watching everybody and the care and the attention they put to the animals is just wonderful. So I'm very happy with, with my new um, little best friend. So thank you, director. Appreciate all your work. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. 
um, Mr. Davis, you can proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, we have Environmental Health, Director Ryan Mast. Uh, FY22 proposed general fund budget of 4.2 million, 36 general fund positions. And we also have air quality fund at 3.9 million at 32 positions. Really a maintenance of effort budget. Uh, the general fund proposed budget includes 177,000 for full, two full-time sustainability positions. And Director Mass does have three slides, Madam Chair. You can thank proceed. You. Yeah, good. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon and to the members of the committee. Um, I think uh, particularly for the past fiscal year, it would be an understatement to say that environmental health has been busy. Um, and I'm particularly proud of our staff and how we were able to rise to the occasion to not contract or not maintain services, but actually expand the services that we've provided across the city and across our programs to help um, not only keep people safe during the pandemic, but also prepare for a greener uh, and more prosperous recovery. And so uh, as it relates to our budget, uh, the one thing that we, we do know is necessary and we wanted to particularly highlight today was some of the work that's been going on in our sustainability office and the, the background and rationale for why we think it's critical at this time to continue to expand uh, the capacity of that particular division, both within the city and the support that it provides across our departments. And so um, just a few uh, quick highlights for what um, we have been working on and undertaking. Uh, we've been working really closely with local nonprofits, Prosperity Works and Partnership for Community Action uh, to provide during the pandemic over 200 homes uh, uh, with, for, within low income areas in the city uh, with free energy audits and upgrades. And these are our homes that are experiencing high energy burdens. Uh, and so just to be able to provide that service and help to identify ways that they can have cost saving measures uh, is particularly important, in, you know, during the, the pandemic, any place that people could save money um, and reduce their costs so that they can spend that on other essential services that they needed uh, was really, you know, a, a, a really great service that we were able to provide. Uh, building upon that effort, uh, we uh, have executed in an underway uh, 100,000 contract with Prosperity Works, and this is uh, funding that was provided by the council. So we appreciate the support on this program. Um, and this is to expand that and launch a community energy efficiency program to provide additional whole home retrofits to low-income homes within the international district. Um, so again, that, that, that project is underway. Uh, we just had a, a follow-up meeting with our partners yesterday. They're conducting the assessments of those homes um, and are really making some great progress. We understand that there's always going to be a, a, a greater need than the resources and, and supply of, of funding provides for that. And so we're continuing to uh, expand upon that and, and adding additional capital where we can. And so we've applied for an additional 350000 uh, in funding that comes from both federal sources as well as private funding sources to continue those programs and, and expand the reach of that effort. Um, both in the international district and other low income and socially vulnerable areas within the city. As it relates to municipal energy, we're, we're, we're on track right now to, um, ha to have about 100% renewable or over 80%, I'm sorry, renewable energy use for municipal operations um, on or before January of 20, 2022. Um, this is in alignment with the goal of achieving 100% of achieving renewable energy use for municipal operations by 2025. A big portion of that is, is, contributed, or is attributed to the Solar Direct project, uh, which is currently under construction and on schedule to be done in the fall of this year. Next slide, please. Um, a couple other efforts that we are, are, are that are currently underway and we're programming is we were awarded this year a grant from, from NOAA to do some mapping uh, around the urban heat island within the city. Uh, we're hoping to use this effort to, to not only a community engagement and education effort, but to use that data to help know where we can, where we can really prioritize additional sustainable in, in, in energy efficiency programs in the future. And so we're really looking forward to getting uh, this campaign off of the, off the ground. Uh, we were one of eight cities in the nation that were awarded uh, the grant this year, and we're really excited to, to work with volunteers and to undertake that, that mapping effort. That will actually occur. It'll be a, a one-day uh, effort that will occur in July of this year where everyone's going out and actually capturing the data. But uh, in the meantime, we're already underway with organizing and coordinating that effort. 
Our office also does a lot of data reporting um, just to kind of make sure that we're measuring up and, and continuing to make progress towards being and, and, main and maintaining being a national leader in sustainability efforts. And so uh, this year we were able to improve our ranking to 40th amongst 100 U.S. cities uh, within the ACEEE Clean Energy Scorecard. Um, and in that, I think what's significant is we were amongst the fifth most improved along U.S. cities, and we're hoping to continue to build off this in the coming years. We're currently um, compiling the data to submit for this year's, and we, we expect to see continued improvement, breaking the, the top 40 and possibly even getting into the top 30 um, of, of U.S. cities for that. Uh, this last year, we were also um, awarded certification for LEED uh, for, I'm sorry, silver certification within LEED for Cities. And so that's a significant um, achievement for our, our building, uh, building codes and the way that we, uh, you know, work with sustainability efforts and in, in our built infrastructure here within the city. Finally, we oversee or undersee overseeing the installation of an additional 18 uh, electric vehicle charging stations. This was funding that was uh, provided from the VW settlement. Um, that construction is underway and scheduled to be done by the end of this month. And we'll be having a ribbon cutting to celebrate that um, in June of 2021. And that's a significant achievement by that by next year, we will have a total of 34 city owned electric vehicle charging stations. Um, and then if we can re remember in 2018, there was only two. And so that's a big jump. And that 34 is actually gonna put us um, at the recommended density level um, that is um, for a city our size. And so we do hope to continue to build upon this in the coming years. Um, and just because we know that there's only gonna be greater need for this. Finally, I just wanted to provide a quick update and this will be brief um, because we are actually submitting to uh, get on the agenda for an upcoming council meeting to do a formal presentation uh, and request uh, approval of the climate action plan from the full council. Uh, and we're, you know, as soon as May 17th, we'll be prepared to do that. And we'll be inviting our Climate Action Task Force members to join us at that presentation. But we just wanted to provide a quick summary that uh, we have formally released the 2021 Climate Action Plan update. This was the first climate action plan that's been released in over a decade within the city of Albuquerque. Uh, and what's significant about the process that we use is we really prioritize the voices of the historically underserved residents to drive the, the policy recommendations that were put forth in this. And we did that by, by bringing together a, a, a climate action task force that was composed of 19 community members who really were the authors of the policy recommendations that came forward to the city, the broader city, um, in, in a way it means that we can uh, more thoughtfully address the, the sustainability needs of the community. So we, we formally release this on Earth Day of this year, but like I say, we look forward to presenting this formally to the council in an upcoming meeting and, and also introducing to some of the task force members that did such great work um, on, this, on this effort. We were really proud of the effort that, that came out of it. So that completes my presentation, but I will stand by for questions. I believe that Councillor Pena lost her connection, so I'll take the meeting uh, until we until she regains her connection. Um, any questions of Mr. Mast? I'm looking for raised hands. Councilor Benson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, Director Mast, you, you've got a lot on your plate and you're doing some great work. I really appreciate all of it. And, you know, some of these things are kind of council initiatives, I mean, and, and it's great to see them coming to fruition. Um, I wanted to ask, I know that when we developed the plastics uh, bag uh, ban, for be lack of better terminology, that, that your department was involved with that, we, that's on a hiatus right now, I guess, due to the pandemic, but it seems like uh, less and less of an issue. There's a lot less uh, focus on germs uh, in a, something like a recycled bag as opposed to uh, um, other issues with, with regard to the pandemic. But are you involved in that or is that decision still remaining with uh, the uh, emergency office? 
Well, Madam President, Councilor Benton, I think it's a great question. The decision is ultimately part of the emergency order, and so that's a that's something that we can we can provide and, and put into. But it's ultimately decision um, with the with the mayor's office on that. But I can say in relation to that, and as it relates to the prioritization of, of a dealing with especially single use plastics in the climate action plan, that we're continuing to explore how we can not only work on the bag ban, but just in, you know expand upon that or, or improve upon that on how we can start to address plastic usage here in the city more formally. And in fact, in the coming, it's either next week or the week after, we're gonna be meeting with the Recycling Coalition members as well to start to think through these things again. And we look forward to engaging with the council um, on that in the coming months. That's great to hear. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Director. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Are there any other questions of Mr. Mass? I don't see any other raised hands, Mr. Mass. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. We know you all do a really great job at environmental health. And, um, you know, I just want to mention and just to follow up to Councillor Benton's question um, as I go to the grocery store and wonder about the, the you know, uh, raising or lifting that ban again, um, how soon that, you know, how soon that might be, especially as we go forward. Um, in, lift, in becoming a turquoise, um, I guess, community. Um, I just kind of wonder that myself, Councillor Benton. So, okay, well, thank you, Mr. Mass. We appreciate you being here with us this afternoon and we will move on to our next department. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, next is Finance and Administrative Services. Director Renee Martinez, uh, the fiscal year 22 general fund budget of 10.7 million, 81 general fund positions. Other funds consist of 70.7 million and 82 positions. Uh, first off, general fund, annual funding of 166,000 is included for short-term rental, software platform, the bonfire update, Oracle Fusion and lease administration software. Uh, next bullet point deals with lodges and hospitality. Uh, combined appropriations increased by 4 million <clears throat> with an anticipated increase in revenues. However, debt service continues to be subsidized uh, from the general fund by 1.2 million. Um, and, and that's that's significantly down from last year, which you uh, might remember was subsidized at 3.5 million. So revenues are coming up. Um, hopefully next year at fiscal year 23, we don't have to we won't have to subsidize uh, lodgers or hospitality uh, for their debt service. Next, we got risk management. Uh, contractual funding is decreased to fund two in-house council positions for a savings of 57,000. Uh, next, fleet management. Funding of 1.1 million is increased for anticipated fuel costs and 100,000 uh, is decreased for outside vehicle maintenance. Uh, last, we got vehicle and computer replacement fund. Uh, One-time funding of 2 million is included for citywide uh, vehicles. And Director Martinez does have two slides, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Welcome, Director Martinez. It looks like you're in a tropical place somewhere. Good afternoon, Madam President uh, and committee members. Uh, so two slides. Um, first is on how our department responded to the pandemic and supported the departments. Um, while many of our city departments have been on the front line supporting our community directly during the pandemic, the financial and administrative services staff have been behind the scenes quietly and competently supporting the departments and handling a much higher than normal need and demand for services. Um, on that first bullet point, as we received the critical FEMA and CARES Act funding last year, we established a cross-functional COVID cost recovery team to manage and account for these funds, including meeting the reporting and compliance requirements directed by both the US Treasury and FEMA. Um, the stress and uncertainties experienced by our employees and families during the pandemic have been significant as to the second point. Our employee assistance program, which operates under the risk management division and under the leadership of Lindsay Campos, Dr. Campos. And it's remarkable when I think about um, Dr. Campos joined the city workforce on February 29th, right before the pandemic started. Um, she came in, organized the counselors in the program, and immediately started to um, meet the demands of our, 
our um, employees and our families. We saw an increase of over 30% in appointment with our counseling sessions over the last, last year. They were all moved on to a video platform and that didn't seem to um, reduce the demand for it. We had um, invested additional funds into this program. You've seen some contract amendments for the Solutions Group, who is um, our provider of two great counselors, Michelle and Paul. In fact, I personally use Michelle and she's wonderful um, to increase the uh, counseling resources to support our workforce. And Dr. Campos has provided, in addition to our counselors, so many more resources to our employees in the form of webinars, um, personal invitations to speak with staff um, and, and departments, and even start talking right at this point with departments about how to move employees back into the offices and address some of the, um, you know, the concerns that the employees are gonna have. Um, moving on to our Office of Management and Budget, they stepped up in a big way during the pandemic to prepare and work with all departments on three budgets over the last year. We also set targets for cost savings in these budgets in order to balance our spending with declining revenues. Our budget team implemented new tracking methods to help us meet our targets. And that included a 15 million in personnel savings and 5 million in, in non-personnel savings in fiscal year 2020. Our economist, Christine Berner, developed new models to forecast revenues during the ever uncertain and changing economic climate that we found ourselves in. Um, both our warehouse and purchasing units responded to the need to buy personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, plexiglass, and all those other items for our employees, all our off, uh, facilities and offices, and the broader community. We purchased over three, 30 million in additional goods and services, and that equates to thousands more purchase requests, um, payments, and so forth that both our purchasing and our accounts payable teams handled during this time to support all the initiatives and programs that both the FEMA and the CARES Act funds provided for. Um, to say that I'm proud of the department st staff for their dedication and ability to respond and adapt to the evolving needs of the city during the pandemic is really an understatement. They're really rock stars and I'm really pleased that uh, uh, on their performance and the city is so well served by them. Going to the next slide. Thanks, thanks Lawrence. Um, so while our purchasing warehouse and budget staff adapted and responded to the many challenges of the pandemic, our other sections of our de department continued the important work of managing the finances of the city. Some of the key accomplishments um, are included here in this slide. We retained our AAA bond rating with uh, S&P. We received an unmodified audit opinion for our fiscal year 2020 finances which included the CARES Act fund as part of the single audit, which is our federal funds audit. We issued $23 million in new geo bonds, as well as 110 million in GRT lodgers tax refunding revenue bonds. So we saved the taxpayers about approximately 5.5 million from refinancing. Over the past two years, the risk management division has focused attention and staff time to pursue reimbursement for damage or loss to city property, what we call subrogation. Um, the risk management team recently hit a new milestone in recovering $2.5 million so far this fiscal year. Our fleet operations continues to innovate and provide new and enhanced levels of services to all our departments. And they have completed a higher volume of work orders this fiscal year as compared to prior year. That was a surprise to me because we felt that um, with the uh, temporary shutdown and having more city employees work from home, that that would go down. But because Fleet has started to provide additional services like their new trailer service shop and drive through service, we've actually seen those very popular with departments. And so we've seen a higher volume of, of work done by our, our Fleet team. Um, vendor outreach is a high priority activity for our purchasing section this year. As you can see, several community events are listed that have been hosted or we've participated in since the beginning of this calendar year. 
Um, these events are providing vendors who are interested or um, already working with us to get, get uh, critical information and guidance on how to do business with the city and how to be an effective partner with us once they are doing business, business with us. And even this morning, our purchasing and accounts payable staff hosted a, a virtual vendor workshop, which was attended by more than 300 vendors. Um, lastly, our treasury office has worked closely with both the planning department and council staff, um, specifically Councilor Gibson staff, to implement a new framework policies and systems to start permitting and collecting taxes from our short-term rentals. And uh, they've been very successful. Last Friday was the launch date for the new program. And I think uh, I heard today that we've already had uh, many of the short-term rentals being permitted and, and uh, even paying fees. Um, so that's just a, a list of several accomplishments from our department. Um, and thank you for your time this afternoon. I stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Mar uh, Martinez. I, we appreciate you so much. Um, I, I can't even begin to tell you based on, um, you know, with COVID and everything, um, the, the worries that kept us all counselors up at night and knowing that you all were at the helm uh, with um, Sanjay and some of the other folks in, in your office um, was actually quite, um, um, I think it, it, it helped us sleep at night a little bit. Um, so counselors, I don't see any hands. I'm looking at Councillor Benton, Councillor Senna, Councillor Rasan, Councillor Gibson, I don't see any hands up. Thank you, Madam President, I'm fine. Councillor Jones? I'm Apparently fine. not, Ms. Martinez. Thank I'm you fine. so I'm much. Fine. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting. So with that, uh, Mr. Davis, we will move on to our next department. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, next up is Human Resources, Anthony Romero, Director. Uh, the fiscal year 22 proposed general fund budget is 6.2 million, 26 general fund positions. But the proposed general fund budget includes one-time funding of 173,000 for bilingual testing, professional development, the labor negotiations contract, and scanning of personnel files. <laughs> the risk management of uh, non-general fund is budgeted at about $2, uh, $2 million, five positions. Uh, Non-recurring funding for unemployment insurance claims of 500,000 is retained in anticipation of COVID related claims. Uh, group self-insurance uh, is budgeted at 92.3 million, uh, zero positions. Of course, that's our group self-insurance uh, fund. An adjustment of 7.1 million is to cover claims and operational expenses associated with increased medical um, costs. Employee insurance is budgeted at 7.7 million, 12 positions. One-time funding of 100,000 is included to conduct a dependent eligibility audit. And Director Romero does have a few slides, Madam President. Welcome, Director Romero. Hello, everyone. Good to see everybody today. Um, I wanted to just take uh, some time to share our tuition reimbursement program with folks. Um, mm -hmm. In FY21, we had an $80,000 budget and we're looking at uh, doubling that budget um, so that we could offer this excellent benefit to many of our coworkers. It really offers uh, the human resources department an opportunity to partnership with all other departments throughout the city, especially in the one Albuquerque spirit. Um, right now, the uh, total reimbursement offered is $140 per credit hour um, and we, uh, allow folks to be in re to be reimbursed for up to 12 credit hours a year. Um, and just to give you an idea of the um, amount that, that that covers is right now UNM tuition costs just under 270 a credit hour. Um, so since 2016, we've had 662 applicants to date. Um, that have uh, gone through the tuition reimbursement program. We've reimbursed for over 3,000 credit hours and um, over the amount of $350,000. Um, this is a wonderful uh, program 
um, that offers support and an incentive. And it also provides access to employees who cannot afford to go to college. And if you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, this infographic shows just in the year 2020, um, we had 150 employees take advantage of the tuition reimbursement program. Over 17 of our city departments, they've received, uh, uh, they've gone to classes uh, for their associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, and various other skills-based courses. Um, those uh, individuals attended eight New Mexico college and nine out-of-state colleges. All of those colleges have to be regionally accredited for the reimbursement to um, happen. Um, as you can see, many of the departments uh, have taken advantage of it, APD being one of the larger. 67% um, of those individuals attended college in New Mexico. Um, and re we reimbursed just under the $80,000 for 674 credit hours completed. So um, that is a, a quick look into our tuition reimbursement program. I know a lot of folks hadn't, haven't heard of it. Um, so I thought it would be an excellent opportunity to share that with the council um, today. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Are there any questions of Mr. Romero? Uh, Councilor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. Sorry, the, the screen's very small, so I can't exactly see. And Director Romero, um, I know that we incorporated this and they're of course just getting started with the new department with the community safety department. Um, but is that included in this or not quite yet as they're getting to roll that out? Uh, Madam Ch uh, or Council President Borrego and Councilor Senna, uh, this does not include the the employees from the Albuquerque Community Safety Department. All right, thank you. You're and I will send a uh, copy to all the counselors of this infographic so that you have that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Romero. I know one of the bills that I sponsored was with regard to appreciating. Um, employees who are, um, you know, go back to school and get trained and obtain certifications or mm -hmm. degrees. Um, I, so this is right in line with that bill that I sponsored um, and, and encouraging that our employees become always uh, in the line of professionalism, become more and more professional in their respective fields. So mm -hmm. I very much appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Benson, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, Madam, Madam President. Um, uh, Director Romero, I, uh, you know, hearing good things about your management of the department. Uh, thanks for, for taking it on. I'm, I'm, uh, one specific question with regard to hiring and getting new hires up and running. Uh, when a department, um, you know, in the past we've heard oh, it takes so long to get through HR and then whatever other hoops before we actually can uh, extend the offer to the uh, job applicant. And I've heard that, that you've speeded that up, Tom. Is that correct uh, uh, pr compared to prior practices? Uh, Council President Borrego and Councilor Benton, um, we are in the process of a program that we're calling here at HR Hiring Reform 2021 where we're really trying to do just that is um, expediting the process to get somebody hired. Um, in my 22 years with the city, that's always sort of been um, an issue that we've always wanted to tackle and try to see if we can do our best to uh, getting folks, the right people in the right jobs as, as quickly as we can to provide services to our community. So we are in the process of doing that right now. We're in phase one, which has three pilot departments. We're very grateful to be working with um, the Animal Welfare Department, uh, Parks and Rec Department, and the Arts and Culture Department um, doing this. Uh, we have been, um, we've done a kickoff celebration on uh, Hiring Reform 2021 with all of the departments. And uh, I'm just very pleased that each of the HR coordinators at the department levels, along with their department directors, have given us a tremendous amount of support to move this forward because it does benefit all of us. 
Yeah, and just, you know, the reason I ask is, you know, there's so much discussion now about the need for certain kind of workers, at least, and the competitive environment we know that exists. Uh, the council's kind of tried to tackle that with regard to some of our engineers or, or we have such great competition with other entities in the state. And um, so, you know, that period of time that it takes before there's an initial uh, decision by a department to hire somebody. And when we actually extend the offer, we can lose those people pretty fast if, we, if we're not as expeditious as possible. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benton. And I, just to follow up, Mr. Romero, and just something that Councillor Benton and I have always kind of worked on is that connection that we have to our universities. And I know Councillor Benton has been very tied to the School of, of Architecture and Planning. And, you know, I've been tied to the School of Public Administration. And I know that you have an internship program with the School of Public Administration right now, but those linkages are just so critical um, to, you know, attracting new sort of, and that, that was actually one of the ways that I was hired into the city as I was an intern um, in, <laughs> the, in family and community services, which was a different name at the time, but, um, you know, reaching out and ensuring that we have those connections is, is critically important. So um, I appreciate that you're doing that. You're correct, uh, Council Vice President, uh, or Council President Borrego, excuse me. We did, uh, I just sat through a couple of weeks ago, a presentation by some of the um, students in the Master of Public Administration program um, talking about utilization studies here um, with the city of Albuquerque. And they had some great information we're awaiting a report from them. Dr. Bruce Perlman will be submitting that to um, not only the HR department, but to the Office of Equity and Inclusion as well. I know that Director Melendez was on that presentation call with us and uh, the students had some great um, observations and recommendations. So excited to get that report in our hands. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Mr. Romero? Director Romero, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with your department. Um, we will move on then, Mr. Davis, uh, to our next department. And if you'd like to introduce that department. Thank you, Madam President. Next up is Municipal Development, Director Patrick Montoya. Fiscal year 22 proposed general fund budget of 71.4 million, 399 general fund positions. Other funds at 27.7 million, 122 positions. The proposed budget includes $11 million transfer for the city county building buyout and renovation, 3.5 million for the Gibson Medical Center. And this is only for the facilities maintenance. Uh, the programmatic side, as we discussed last week, uh, resides in the Department of Family and Community Services and 348,000 for six additional security, off security officer positions dedicated to the Parks and Recreation Department. And Count, uh, Director Montoya does have two slides, Madam President. Madam President and Councilors, thank you for allowing us to present this afternoon. Uh, DMV, of course, is one of the larger departments within city government uh, and probably the most diverse. We have 13 divisions. So we do cover the gamut, as you know, from security to maintenance to capital to street projects. So we are all over the place. Um, I first need to begin by thanking uh, Christine Chi, who is in the room with us this afternoon for her hard work in putting the budget together, working with the budget office uh, and in preparing all of the answers to the questions that were generated by council staff and the counselors. So for Christine, just a, a big thank you for that. I'd also like to introduce one of our two deputy directors, uh, Paul Rogers is in the room with us as well. He oversees both the crossing guard program as well as security. And then I'm pleased to announce that we have just selected and the individual starts on Saturday, but one of our new deputy directors, Alan Morella, who many of you are familiar with. Alan was a deputy city attorney and is not going to come over to DMD uh, to oversee seven of the divisions. And then I think in addition to that, I, I definitely need to thank all DMD staff. They have worked extremely hard over the last year during COVID, uh, whether they were working from home or out in the field or just uh, they, 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 it 
worked extremely hard in making the department shine and I, I do appreciate their hard work and I want to thank all of them. Let me begin real quick with the slide and it'll just be a quick overview, but uh, we were very pleased this year to announce that we had uh, roughly $170 million in projects between March and December of 2020. Uh, we were a hardworking group, uh, several large projects, community centers uh, throughout the entire city, a lot of street projects, new road projects, uh, roundabouts. Uh, it's the first time I believe in DMV history that we were able to put this amount of money out in the streets to keep people working and to generate some grocery sheet tax for materials and those sort of things. Uh, we really did shine when it came to when it comes to um, you know making making those projects happen. I just wanted to highlight very quickly some of those that are key to uh, this administration, to the counselors and to the community. One was the uh, Westgate Community Center, which is scheduled to open on June the 2nd. That's in Councilor Pena's district. And I'm pleased to announce that phase two of that uh, community center has been fully designed. Uh, after the passage of the 2021 bond program, we would hope to bid this project, the second phase of that project, come March or April of 2022. Uh, in addition to that, the Southeast Area Command in Councilor Davis's district that is under construction now. We are looking at a fall completion, 8,000 square feet. And then phase two has also been designed. That one would be ready to bid uh, in the early uh, year of 2022. That is a 14,000 square foot facility. So at the end of the day, in about a year and a half or so, we will have 22,000 square feet of Southeast Area Command uh, that will be used by APD and we'll have community rooms for the local neighborhoods. Um, we're working closely with uh, Director Boylan is in the room with us as well, but the solid waste maintenance building on Edith Street, that's about 20% complete. That will add 55,000 square feet of uh, facility space for maintenance and uh, general operations in solid waste. And then to complement that is the West Side facility out in Cerro, Colorado. Uh, that is a new facility that will house um, the, the, all of the vehicles that dump trucks from the west side. Um, I know that you have been briefed on that, but one of the nice things about that is um, all trucks that are on the west side will be housed on that end of the, of the city. So there will no longer be the need to cross the river back and forth in order to, you know, to, to haul trash. Uh, the International Library, another large project in Councilor Davis's district, that is about 70% complete. Uh, that is a fall completion and that will add 25,000 square feet uh, in, in, in that neighborhood. Uh, Singing Arrow in Councillor Harris's district, again, another project that uh, should be complete by fall. Uh, Explora in Councillor Benton's district, mid-fall for that project. And then uh, for those of you that are work in this building when we all come back, uh, the Plaza Eatery, we have a full renovation of the cafeteria down in the lower level that we are hoping to get scheduled for opening right around July 1st or thereabouts in anticipation of all employees coming back to work. Uh, smart city technology in our parking division is very quickly. Uh, our goal there is to provide drivers with a stress-free experience as they're coming in and out of the parking structures. Uh, space management, uh, technology that basically monitors where spaces are available. Uh, if you've come into Civic Plaza and some of our other parking structures, you are not, uh, are, will know the number of spaces that are available both in reserve and those for the general public. Uh, we're hoping to include that technology and any of the other structures that we don't have that now. Uh, we are moving more and more to uh, no contact, uh, contact less payments. Uh, we've got kiosks set up throughout uh, our parking structures. And then the last thing that we're really working on quite heavily with environmental health are the EV charging stations throughout the city. Uh, we had several installed out of the zoo, some of the bio park, a couple of Explora, some of the heights, so the charging stations are another uh, project that we're working on. Uh, city County building, I'll make this one very quick. Uh, we anticipate that the county will be out of this building right around the middle of August. We do have a plan for reallocating space to existing departments, as well as moving three or four other departments into this building. Uh, we will be able to consolidate and uh, improvise and make better use of the space that we have here. Uh, as Mr. Davis mentioned, there is a budget for that. Right around five and a half million dollars will be used for renovations, repairs, remodel, and relocation of some of these city departments. 
The 527 streetlights, uh, those are streetlights that um, will be, uh, most of those have already either been bid and awarded, or in some cases are under construction right now. Uh, we will have new streetlights in the southwest area of the city, Southwest Mesa. That was a project funded by uh, the uh, quarter cent tax uh, in Council of Pena's district. We have new lights in Albert Homestead, in South San Pedro, the International District, Mesa Vista, and in Councilor Benton's district in Moss Park, they've already started uh, roughly 45 lights in that district there. Those are underway as well. And then the last item on this slide is the pay scale for uh, engineers. Um, I, I believe councils, councilors and council spoke quite loudly in telling us that we were not competitive enough to uh, hire and retain engineers uh, within our traffic engineering, traffic design group. Uh, because of that, we were able to initiate a new pay plan for engineers within the department. A little over 27 employees were able to get a bump in pay. I'm happy to say that now we believe we're very competitive with not only the Mexico Department of Transportation, the county, uh, Sandia Labs, but uh, we're hoping that we're able to recruit and retain uh, those quality engineers that we need in order to help design and carry out uh, the projects that we currently have. Uh, next slide, Lawrence, please. Uh, very quickly regarding uh, Vision Zero, uh, I'll, I'll announce that Tara Reed is our coordinator. Uh, that is a new program within the Department of DMD. Uh, the mayor has made the announcement. We will launch that program probably mid-summer uh, or so. We do have a campaign blitz that will talk a little bit about Vision Zero, how we've taken on the challenge, how we uh, anticipate moving forward. Uh, again, we are briefing, I believe, council staff within the next couple of weeks and then are pleased and are willing to do a full presentation, full council, uh, if in fact you would like to have that. The Indian School Bike Notch, uh, that is the uh, crossing underneath Indian School. That is the last crossing along the North Diversion Channel. Uh, if you're a bicyclist, you no longer need to sit on, or actually uh, stay on any of the, the, the main streets as you come under Indian School. That will allow you to cross without any interruption and interfering or actually uh, mingling with, with the traffic. But that is the last crossing in order to make that, uh, that stretch complete. Uh, 12th and Manal Roundabout, I know this is in Councilor Benton District as well. That project was completed several months ago. I think the last phase of that, we're talking about uh, the landscaping within the, the, the roundabout itself. The roundabout, uh, I'll just mention, it is a new buzzword within city government. We just completed the one at Rio Grande and Candelaria in Councilor Benton's district. We're currently designing one in Councilor Senna's district. We're looking at another one uh, in Councilor Pena's district. So I believe that you're going to see more and more roundabouts that uh, will be initiated by council uh, and then actually carried out and built by DMD. Uh, 1.3 million in new striping. I, I, Happy to say that we have striped uh, either long lines or uh, any sort of uh, uh, signals within the, the, the pavement itself. 375 mile lanes of, uh, of striping, and then we have completed 98 intersections. Um, the other thing that I might mention is that uh, on the very last one, this is in Councillor uh, Davis's district, in partnership with the Federal Highway Administration and the local uh, community, we were able to complete a, what is referred to as a road safety audit. That was just completed uh, several months ago. That gave us a better and a bigger picture of what uh, pedestrian safety should look like on Louisiana between Gibson and Lomas. Uh, that study told us that we need additional lighting. We might need to go with a road diet of sorts. Could we put a hawk signal in or even additional crossings? And because of that, we feel that uh, if this is successful, then we would like to carry this, this program into other parts of the city where we have high uh, pedestrian fatalities or uh, pedestrian interaction with, uh, with automobiles. Uh, with, with that, Madam Chair, Madam President, that concludes my presentation. I stand for any questions you might have. Madam President? Yes. Um, so I do have a question for a couple of questions for you, Director. Um, I'm sorry, Councilor Gibson, I didn't see your hand. Yes, oh, go ahead. You did, sorry. Um, so, uh, Director, I, um, 
My first question is a, a just a little question. You're, I'm asking about the Indian School bike notch. What what intersection is that again at, sir? So uh, that takes you under. Uh, it, it's under. It's it's in, It goes under Indian School, and I'm. Uh, I believe it's right at I just a little east of I-25. Okay. In that general area. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the other question that, that that I'm most concerned about, um, one of the things I'm really concerned about, is the six hundred and twenty thousand dollars that uh, the council um, in I, I can't, really can't remember. Well, I guess it wasn't last year because we just did. Uh, I don't know. This past year in budget kind of got a little confused. So I, maybe it was last year, uh, and we asked that. Um, uh, that the, the uh, professional um, engineers, and I think it was a project lead or project managers, um, get a bump in, in pay. So I'm, I'm very happy that you're able to give uh, uh, raises to 27 employees there. I'm wondering, um, were, uh, did all engineers get a raise or just some of them? And who were the other employees who got raises? Um, Madam President, Councilor Gibson, let me, let me answer that. Uh, okay. So not all engineers within city government were entitled to the raise. It was only those that uh, called for a PE and uh, you know where their job was related to to actual project management. So there were a couple of other departments and one actual employee in DMV that did not get the pay bump because the specs for their job did not call for project management. And then the engineers that are in the M series under a, a bargaining agreement with the union, the M series engineers, which are more junior engineers within the department did not get the pay bump as well. So those that received the, the the raise in DMD and I believe uh, in possibly two in planning were the E series. So it was the 16, 17, 18, 19, and the 20s. Okay. Um, and can you tell me, um, uh, so then the 27 employees were, were most of those engineers? Who were the other ones? Uh, Madam President, Councilor Gibson, uh, all, all those that received the pay increase were uh, engineers, they were PEs. So it, it was all of our engineers uh, within the department. Gotcha, gotcha, thank you. Um, and um, do we have a plan in place to, uh, it sounds like we're getting started, getting them more competitive. Uh, do we have a plan in place to increase them in, in, in future years. So uh, we can not only hang on to the good ones that we have, but um, have give us a little more um, edge in, in hiring future PEs. Uh, Madam President, Councilor Gibson, we have been working with the uh, Human Resources Department. So in this first phase of any sort of increase, uh, one of the things that we were asked to do was to take a look at a pay scale that would be unique just to the engineers themselves. We were not able to achieve that uh, for a lot of reasons. So uh, to answer your question, probably the easiest way to answer it is that uh, a good number of the engineers are at the very last step within the existing scale. Right. So in order to raise those salaries, other than whatever cost of living adjustments we get you know, year after year, we would have to develop a, a unique pay scale just for the engineering group. And we're still in discussions with HR to see if that's an opportunity for us to pursue. And if it is, we would hope to be, we would hope to be able to do that within the next year or so. But right now, just about everyone is topped out or at the very top step within the scale that they're in. Yeah, so that, you know, that kind of indicates to me that uh... Uh, that hasn't been seriously studied or, or um, you know, looked at in, in terms of trying to update them and, and get them, get that, you know, reflective of, uh, you know, what the, what the market is. So, 
Um, okay, there might be other questions on that, but thank you so, so much. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. It appears that uh, Councillor Benton has a question or comment. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Uh, Montoya. Um, we appreciate your taking, you know, moving on, on those hires, of, of, uh, those positions and, and raising those salaries, I guess. Um, it's not only retention of, of the engineers and the smart folks we have in your department, but but uh, competing on the market for new ones. Um, and I, I guess I had maybe a contradiction, at least from, from some of the information I received from our staff, maybe they were mistaken, but that um, that we are not competitive, competitive on this level with the state DOT, with the other agencies we are, is that correct? Uh -huh. Madam President, Councilor Ben, uh, my understanding, and of course, I was briefed by, by uh, partially by staff that helped put this together. But my understanding is that we are competitive at entry level. And in some cases, where they're a little more senior. Uh, if you'd like, let me just go ahead and pursue that one more time. Uh, yeah. I work very closely with the district engineer, Justin Gibson, and let me at least get an answer for you. But my understanding is that we are uh, sort of at the same level. Uh, that with, with our counterparts within the area. Okay. And then um, w were there any obstacles? I mean, as far as implementing the raises, um, uh, do we have actual new hires with the, under those raises? Uh, Madam President, Councilor Benton, uh, we do not. We do have uh, that position, two, actually two engineering positions advertised. We're in the process now of advert or uh, interviewing uh, <coughs> one one individual, uh, uh, and we have another two that we're interviewing. But um, it, it was quite interesting because that that is a, uh, an ongoing posted position for the engineers, and um, unfortunately we haven't had that many applicants. So I know we're in a very competitive market out there, and when I talk to either folks from the private sector or even at the state or county level with uh, Elias and his group. They too are having problems recruiting just because there's such a demand. Okay, and uh, yeah, once we do, I mean, just following up on my my uh, conversation with Director Romero, um, expediting this, you know, uh, uh, once we do identify uh, an app, you know somebody who looks good, like promising hire, and uh, um, you know the time it takes between that decision on the part of the department and then the actual extension of the formal extension of the offer to the applicant um, is kind of critical. So just something, you know, I just want to raise that, not ask you a question about it, but point that out to you as well, that, that you know, that's kind of equally as important to be quick to offer the, <laughs> the, the job as soon as we can, you know, administratively, I know it has to go up the food chain. Um, and let's see. I think you clarified uh, the M series did not get the raise, or the M series got the raise and not the E series. Uh, and a president, Councilor Ben, the reverse of that. So the reverse, M series yeah. got the raise, the M series uh, could not. So it was it was senior and project manager and your PEs. Uh, Madam, Madam President, Councilor Ben, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Um, I'm looking at other councillors. Um, Anthony Romero, did you have a comment or is that from previous raised hand? I do Directly not have a you. comment, Councillor President Borrego. Go ahead. I do not have one. Oh, you don't? Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Senna. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Dr. Montoya, I first want to just mention um, my appreciation to you and your staff um, on the many projects that you're working on in the district, uh, particularly with Melissa Lozoya. Um, I feel like I've seen her in person more than maybe some of my own staff um, for her going out in the field um, to address some of the concerns that we had in the district. Um, but my question is, um, is there going to be a push for more security along trans in transit? Or um, I know that you just said that there's going to be an increase for parks. 
but is there one for transit? Uh, Madam President, uh, Councilor Senna, so in last year's budget, there were an additional seven transit security officers that were provided for us uh, that are assigned to the transit department, spe more specifically to ride buses. Um, as you know, uh, it, year before last, we merged the transit security staff with the DMV security staff. And as a result of that, we increased the, the number of, of, of uh, individuals. So in this year's budget, we did get the six additional positions for security for parks and rec. We didn't get any for transit, but we have yet to fill the seven that, um, you know, that, that are vacant. We, I believe, and Paul's in the room with me now, he can correct me, but we have nine pending, so we'll have nine new officers on shortly. And uh, we're, we're actively recruiting those positions as well. That's another one where it's an ongoing recruitment as best we can. Um, it's, it's another position that's a little hard to fill sometimes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Senna. I don't see any other raised hands from any other councillors. Uh, Mr. Montoya, I would just uh, say that I uh, what I had heard is in concurrence with what Councillor Benton heard regarding competitiveness. Again, you know, I mean, with DOT, is that we were not completely competitive. So I would be interested also in that information. Um, because we we do need we do have quite a few projects, um, and particularly in my district that are going to be initiated, and we need um, you know we need to be as competitive as possible in that particular um, field. Um, I I just want to say also that um, un unless there's any other comments regarding the budget. Um, I just want to offer my condolences to um, Director Montoya, and I know he lost one of his 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 wife recently, and and I think it's important that we acknowledge that in light of all of this, he is still very professional. And um, you know, thank you so much for everything that you do, uh, Director Montoya, and your staff. So. Um, with that, um, we're gonna move on to uh, uh, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, I think we have four, from what I can count, we have four departments that are still needing to present just for the public's sake. Um, what I counted was aviation, solid waste. Um, I had my list here and now I, of course I've misplaced it. Um, let's see, transit and um, is that right? My Madam, um, Madam President, we do have six. Uh, two, uh, the Office of Inspector General and Office of Internal Audit. Are okay, those are the ones not on my list, of course. <laughs> so, okay, so we have uh, five or six? Six. Six additional. Okay, can you just for the public's sake so that they know maybe if they want to sign in or out or whatever, um, can you list those in order of what how they're presenting, please? Yes, Madam President. So first we got the Office of Inspector General. Next we got Office of Internal Audit. After that we have the Planning Department. Uh, after that we have Aviation. Uh, then comes Solid Waste and we finally end with Transit. Thank you so much. So um, we are moving on and if you would like to introduce our next uh, set of directors and guests, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Next we have the Office of Inspector General. Acting Inspector General Nicole Kelly, FY22 proposed general fund budget of 567,000 for general fund positions. And really it's a maintenance of effort budget. Uh, the proposed budget includes uh, 28,000 for the creation of a senior investigator position. This will not be a new position, but a upgrade of an existing position within, within a department. Good afternoon, Ms. Kelly, go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam President and Counselors. Um, you know, with the unexpected passing of the former Inspector uh, General Ken Bramlett um, last December, we really saw the impacts of being such a flat organization. Um, we, at that time, there were three um, investigators 
um, all E16 series that reported directly to the inspector general. So at the time of his passing, there wasn't a natural succession plan um, for one of the investigators to kind of fulfill that, that uh, needed role. So what we're asking is, um, and it's actually something that Ken um, had the fortitude to, to kind of start drafting um, early last fiscal year, um, was to, to create a, a senior investigator position. Um, so rather than asking for funding for a new position, we're asking that um, the differential between the um, investigator and the senior investigator position, which is the $28,000 um, budget with, is this $20,000 budget increase. Um, it would be, as Lawrence mentioned, an internal recruitment. So it'd be open to one of the three current um, um, investigators. Hopefully they'll all apply. Um, and so we will then have a, a, a senior position. Okay. Is, is, does that conclude your presentation? Yes, um, we can, you know, it, it has been a, um, an interesting year. We have seen with, um, with the, the onset of the, the pandemic, there had been a decline in um, complaints received from the various channels. Um, we think some of that is just, you know, people um, bunkering down and, and staying home and following the governor's guidelines. Um, and so we're, we're hoping to re-engage the community, re-engage the departments and employees to remind them that we're here. Um, if they, you know, if they know of fraud waste, uh, uh, fraud waste and abuse or suspect it, that they can always reach out to us through various channels. Um, so we're working with GovTV to develop um, a, a video um, so that we can be included um, with the NEO onboarding training so that new hires know that we're here. Um, and that we can send it out to various departments and put it on our website as well. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Any questions of the counselors? I don't see any hands up, Ms. Kelly. So um, we appreciate you being here this afternoon and uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. So we will move on, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Next, we have the Office of Internal Audit. Uh, Acting City Auditor is also Ms. Nicole Kelly. <laughs> uh, busy, busy woman, Miss um, uh, Kelly. Uh, FY22 proposed general fund budget of 949,008 general fund position. And there's really, it's just a maintenance of effort budget, no major changes for the department. Thank you. Counselors, are there any questions? I don't see any hands raised. Thank you again, Ms. Kelly, and uh, we appreciate your being here with us this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Okay, Mr. Davis, we will move on to our next department. I see Mr. Williams in the queue. So I presume that that would be planning. You are correct, Madam <laughs> President. Uh, planning is up next, Brendan Williams, Director. FY22 proposed general fund budget of 16.4 million, 166 general fund positions. The proposed budget includes 331,000 for three new positions and associated operational costs that will increase the department's capacity to manage the city's new construction projects. And uh, these, these are the bigger projects coming online, Orion, Netflix, and uh, Mr. Williams will expand on that in the next slide. Uh, 178,000 to cover annual ongoing maintenance and cloud support of Posse and Evolve software. Uh, um, and this is offset by a 2% technology fee that will be charged um, to cover the cost of these uh, new software maintenance costs. And finally, the elimination of uh, the elevator inspector program at a net cost savings of $168,000. And Mr. Williams has, does have a few slides. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Williams, welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam President and members of the committee. Uh, glad to be here this afternoon. As Mr. Davis mentioned, um, we'll, we've got a couple slides to go over here, but uh, like many of the other directors, uh, I'm very pleased to report uh, from a department standpoint uh, that during this past year, the planning department has continued to provide a, a range of services with uh, little or no interruption. And I'm, I'm very happy about that. Those include, uh, as the committee knows, uh, all sorts of things from permitting and inspections related to construction projects, to plan review, to case analysis, to the staffing of boards and commissions. We've, we've been able to uh, do it differently, but we've been able to 
uh, conduct the various uh, public hearings that, that are associated with develop, uh, different development procedures. And then uh, also uh, last but not least, uh, our enforcement uh, team, our enforcement efforts have continued, uh, not only for property maintenance standards, what this committee typically hears uh, as members of committees or councils, uh, but we also uh, had a role in, in enforcement and education of the public health order, as well as a couple different council initiatives related to outdoor seating for restaurants and, and outdoor retail. So uh, very happy to, uh, uh, very happy for the team to report that, that we've uh, continued to do business as usual or, or business slightly modified. Uh, our first slide uh, outlines uh, information as it relates to uh, permitting standards uh, year to date. Uh, I can report that uh, these numbers are consistent with uh, fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 20. Uh, again, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we, did not, we did not slow down from a department standpoint. Uh, as Mr. Davis mentioned, uh, one of the proposals uh, in anticipation of projects, large projects, uh, whether those be private projects such as the Orion or the Netflix, which uh, this group is familiar with, or uh, several large city projects, capital projects, uh, swimming pools, uh, libraries, uh, police substations that are uh, currently either uh, in process or about to begin that process. Uh, we understand and, and we know from experience that uh, in order to keep up with the demand, uh, particularly for these larger, more complex projects, we're gonna need some additional capacity from a staffing level. So uh, one of the key issues that we're proposing uh, is the addition of three inspectors in our construction, our building safety division, our construction folks uh, to help uh, meet the demand that, that we know is coming. Uh, our second slide outlines uh, similar considerations associated with our community planning area assessments or our CPA assessments. Uh, under the IDO, uh, 12 of these CPAs around the city uh, on a scheduled basis uh, get a deep dive by our staff uh, there are costs that are associated on the slide there toward the left-hand side uh, that, that pertain to, to those costs and those needs. Uh, the first CPA is um, probably about three quarters of the way completed. Uh, we've had to modify, of course, to do that differently during the pandemic. Uh, but those meetings with the community, uh, soliciting out, uh, input from them, uh, as well as providing them with, with guidance in the collection and, and compilation of that information, uh, those efforts still continue. Um, that will conclude my presentation and we'll certainly, certainly stand for any questions. Are there any questions of Mr. Williams? Councilor Benson. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, Director Williams, um, we, uh, do you have any um, in the planning and advanced planning at, at this point, uh, or I guess it's specifically senior planners. You have a vacancy now, if I'm not correct, due to the transfer of, uh, of one of your senior planners over to the DMD for uh, uh, the uh, Vision Zero coordination position. Is that right? Yes, sir. And, and that's not proposed to be filled in the budget at this time. Uh, Madam President, Councilor Benton, not specifically at this time, we do have several vacancies at uh, some of our entry level position, planner positions, if you will, that we are actively working to fill our division manager for the urban design and development uh, uh, division. Uh, we, we are in the process of filling that. Um, and obviously we're, we're amenable to uh, working depending upon needs of the department. Uh, working to, to fill any additional positions or, or making those requests to add additional positions if, if capacity in those areas are needed. Okay. And um, is it correct that the all new hires require, any new hire requires the uh, authorization of the CAO? Uh, 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 Madam President, Councilor Benton, uh, uh, part of the process is is the CAO, uh, I believe is, is the final signature or the final uh, clicker of the last box, uh, whatever the situation may be, uh, but certainly the CAO is, is involved in, in hires. Yes, sir. All right. And um, so I, I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the uh, focus on the uh, community planning assessment process and the need for that. Um, 
is, is are we hoping that, that maybe one of these new hires could help with that? It seems like that is such a critical uh, the the entire plan for doing that and three per year, et cetera, is really important to the public understanding and involvement in our planning processes. Um, you anticipate one of these these uh, I guess more junior planners would would pitch in towards that. Uh, Madam President, Council Ben, absolutely. Um, you know, we have uh, some folks that, that were trying to get hired. We have a couple uh, uh, new planners, certainly with lots of experience, but are, but are new to the city of Albuquerque. Um, and then, of course, as you're aware, we've got uh, kind of a, a breakup of current, what we call current planners, as well as long range planners. Uh, we've got all hands on deck. Uh, our deputy director, uh, that oversees the urban design and development uh, uh, division has rolled up his sleeve. And so we're, we're cross training and we're trying to get people uh, up to speed in, in any area or any project that, that we can uh, borrow or, or, or beg uh, somebody from uh, another assignment or another responsibility to help us. We're, we're doing everything we can to utilize that. Appreciate that, Mr. Director. Thanks a lot. Any other counselors? I don't see any other raised hands this afternoon, Mr. Williams. Um, I, I just wanna say, I just wanna give a shout out to uh, Director Williams. Um, during COVID, um, we had some bills, I, I sponsored some bills regarding um, you know, the expansion of restaurants into the parking lots and um, uh, retail uh, to ensure that businesses kept up um, and tried to stay afloat. And uh, Director Williams worked really hard to ensure that P the application process and the permitting process was very, very efficient. So I just wanna give you a shout out Director Williams for working with us on that and, and doing it so quickly. Cause I think we, we got it done in about a week's time from the time the bill was adopted, the bills were adopted. So thank you for that. And, um, and I'm sure that our, our small businesses and our large businesses would concur with that comment. So thank you for that. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to move on then uh, to uh, Mr. Davis. Would you like to introduce our next director? And I see her in the queue. Um, so uh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> next uh, department is aviation, director Nika Ellen. Uh, FY22 proposed operating budget of 66.3 million, 20, 293 positions, sorry about that. Uh, the proposed budget includes the elimination of an IT manager position at a savings of 118,000. Uh, contract escalators of 42,000 will occur for landscaping and aircraft maintenance. And finally, a result, as a result of an increase of indirect overhead allocations, IDO wage transfers will increase by 682,000. And Director Allen does have a few slides, Madam President. Thank you, welcome Director Allen. Good afternoon, Madam President, members of the committee. Our goal this year was to keep the airport running and safe during the most challenging year of the airport's history and to support the private sector partners who live here. The airport quickly employed COVID safe practices and cut our spending. Luckily, the airport received much federal aid this year to help us continue to run the airport during the most challenging year of our history. As you can see, here was the aid that we received to total up to $27 million, and we still have yet to hear the amount that we will receive from the American Rescue Act. We have four years to spend all of our allocated funds on a reimbursable basis. The FAA does have strict guidelines for how the money can be spent, but we have been spending it to keep our staff employed and for general operating. Next slide, please. As you can see, we, at our worst, we were down 95% in passenger traffic and luckily had a steady increase to 75% down. And we were steadily at 75% down until the governor rescinded the 14 day quarantine requirement. And then luckily jumped up to about 50%, which is better than we anticipated. 
We don't anticipate being back to 2019 levels until 2024. Some of our direct routes have come back to the Sunport in the last few months, but and we are actively working with our airline partners to bring back the other last flights. And that is all I have today. Are there questions of Ms. Allen counselors? Ms. Allen, thank you so much. We all look forward to taking that next flight somewhere, um, hopefully soon. Hopefully, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Home stretch, two more departments. Uh, next, we got solid waste, uh, Director Matthew Whalen. Uh, fiscal year 22 proposed operating budget of 84.6 million, 503 positions. Uh, the proposed budget includes funding of 133,000 for four additional positions to maintain and clean up illegal dumping sites <clears throat> along the art corridor. 312,000 is included to add five positions dedicated to citywide illegal dumping sites and homeless camp cleanup. 225,000 transfers uh, to en environmental health for the sustainability office expansion. 674,000 to staff the Westside vehicle maintenance shop at Cerro Colorado. And finally, 110,000 for three full-time positions dedicated to the West Side and the Edith location tire shop. And Matthew, Director Whelan does have a few slides, Madam President. Thank you, welcome Director Whelan. Thank you, Council President and Councilors. Um, I have one slide and I just wanted to kind of touch on a few things that our department was able to do <clears throat> with the rate increase that we received partially in fiscal year 21 that we are currently in and what our plans are for the fiscal year going forward. Um, as you know, during COVID, we stayed working at about 95% um, operations. We weren't able to really send anybody home because we were an essential um, department. But during that time, refuse increased by about 10%, about 14% recycling increased by 10%. But although that was happening, we were still able to do some good things with the partial half year rate increase. And one of the things we were able to do was we were able to um, take on 5.3 new acres of medians, which were throughout the art corridor and a couple other areas of town that came off of warranty and were put into our inventory. We were also able to remediate our major or minor re renovations on 6.1 acres that included areas all over the city, um, areas such as uh, Trisco from Coors to Central, uh, Laguna and Central, San Mateo and Eastern, Louisiana from Lomas to the freeway was new, and from, on Manal from University to Carlisle, we just finished that renovation, and we are currently in the process of starting some renovations on Coors around the Montano area for those medians that have been, have been uh, dilapidated. And then we have plans for other new um, medians going forward in fiscal year 22. And, uh, the half year rate increase allowed us to continue our operations in clean cities, which saw increases in large item pickups by about 40%. Illegal dumping was up about 48%. Graffiti was up 12%. And we continued our neighborhood cleanups. Um, in our collections areas, as I said, we had more residential refuse and more residential recycling. Um, and in our disposal department, it allowed us to cover the increases at all three of our convenience centers, which during the pandemic, we're seeing increases of 15 to 25%, and at Eagle Rock, it was even higher than that. One of the other things the, the half year rate increase allowed us to do, it allowed us to cover a lot of overtime costs that were related to a switch in how we were running the department due to COVID by going to a route-based model of um, pay as opposed to an hourly rate model, which we did that for the safety of our employees. And it allowed us to continue our recycling program even though that we've been um, kind of underfunded through our rate structure for the recycling program due to issues outside the control of anybody in our city, state, or country uh, due to what happened in 2018 with China, that helped. So if we can continue all of our recycling programs, and it also helps that we can increase our recycling programs. So going into fiscal year 22, we're going to continue to do the things I just talked about, but also um, this full year of a rate increase will help us cover losses in our commercial refuse revenue. We suffered losses throughout the pandemic as businesses were shut down. We were proactively contacting them and reducing their service so that they weren't having to pay for service that they weren't receiving. We weren't gonna be picking up empty cans. So we saw about 665 businesses that kind of went away, but they're starting to come back as things have opened up. 
but we'll still have some losses in fiscal year 22 and the rate, the full year of a rate increase will help us cover that. It'll help us staff all of our new facilities. We're gonna to continue to renovate and take on new medians. And uh, we have a plan that we've been using for the, the last few years, but we're finalizing a plan that we're gonna be giving out to show what the new renovations will be as we work hand in hand with DMD. Uh, we're gonna increase our operations in the Clean City Division, which will include the designated crew designated to the ARC corridor that will be going up and down that ARC corridor and at least one to two blocks into the neighborhoods to help with anything that we see within that area. We'll have an, a, a designated illegal dumping crew, which will add another one to our, our, our staff. And um, it'll help with our large item pickup because right now our large item pickup team has to step in whenever we have more calls than we have staff. And it'll allow us to begin to implement our CDL Academy. This is something we began to develop when I first got to the department um, and we had to put it on hold, but we've, during COVID we finalized it. And now we're working with HR to get it in and we'll be working with the union to get it implemented. And our target date for that is January 1. And our CDL Academy is basically um, an academy where people can come in as a laborer with just a high school diploma um, at 18 years old, and they can begin in our department and we can create a pathway for them to obtain their CDL, become a driver, and then move up and on to different areas of our department because we're a unique department that has almost every type of job from accounting to um, uh, marketing, to upper management, mid-level management, dispatch, and, and all these other things. So we're really excited about that. And also during this, we, we were able to, during this last year, we began two major construction projects, the Westside Vehicle Maintenance Facility um, and the Edith Maintenance Facility. And lastly, I'd like to say we were very excited that we were awarded this last year, the New Mexico Recycling Coalition's Compost Diversion Project of the Year for Sierra, Sierra Colorado Landfill. And what that is, is we began using an alternative cover a slurry mulch that we use with all of our green waste. We mulch and we slurry it, and it becomes a six-inch base cover as we close down our cells at the landfill. Um, and it's something that never that hadn't been done before in the state, so we had to work with the New Mexico Environmental Department for them to improve it. But it's a much better product, and it is a product that we have, and it's a reusable product because we're using our green waste to do this, and we're not having to buy coverage for the landfill. So this is better as we close down cells. It's better for the environment. And it's a reuse of a product that we want to get more of. So we're really excited about that. Um, and with that, I'll stand for any questions. Councillor Benton, I see your hand up. I see Councillor Gibson's hand up. I see Councillor Jones' hand up. So we will proceed. Councillor Benton, you're Thank muted. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam President. We'll try to make it quick uh, with that lineup of questions. Um, uh, Director Whalen, thanks for the great job you do uh, at Solid Waste. I wanted to ask you, um, where where is the transfer facility? I may have been told, but I forgot the so, new one. Uh, Council President and Councilor Benton, what we're doing is we're breaking that out into phases. We have two locations that we are still working with the property owners to buy to build a transfer station. The transfer station is in phase three of our phasing of what we're doing for the whole project. Phase one is doing the, the two maintenance facilities, one at the landfill and the one on Edith, and we are doing those right now. Phase two will be the admin building, and then phase three will be the transfer station. And we're hoping to obtain the property uh, soon so that we can begin doing what we need to do to get that ready for the transfer station. Okay, thanks. And then uh, the other question, um, just looking at our own staff, uh, crunching of numbers here, talking about the uh, acres of medians, uh, existing median landscapes in need of uh, rehabilitation led by, I guess who, District 2. Um, I was wondering, I mean, this seems like a pretty tall lift, just maintaining these. You know, we've we finished the capital budget. We're adding more. Everyone loves them. Uh, every councilor wants to have more in their district. Uh, you know, District 2 probably doesn't have that many more opportunities for them, but uh, it makes me, it, it worries me somewhat that we, we, we're increasing a, a acreage and are we going to be able to keep up with these rehabilitation projects and especially being responsive to the, the need and the strong, the strongest needs in, in the, I think it was three districts, uh, yeah, two, six, and seven. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, President and Councillor Ben. Well, prior to the rate increase in 21, we were 
we were not funded for renos or minor renovate, major or minor renovations. So we were kind of doing it wherever we could pinch money and cut corner, not cut corners, but cut areas and use that money for them. But now that we're funded and part of that rate increase, there was um, a percentage for uh, remediation. And I think that we have a very good plan that we've put in place in the past. And now that we have money, we're updating that plan because now we can literally look and see which ones we can do as opposed to just addressing them if they get damaged. And then if none are damaged, then, hey, let's move on to this one. Now that we do have a set amount of money, we're going to incorporate that into our plan so that we can come up with a five-year plan to show where we're going to be hitting. And I think we'll be able to get to what we need to. All right. Thanks a lot. Councillor Gibson. Sorry, I, I did not raise my hand. I don't see that it's raised here. Oh, okay. I, sh I showed it earlier. Maybe it was from before. Councillor Jones. Madam Chair, I did not raise my hand. It is not raised. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, when I checked the queue, there were some hands raised. Maybe, I don't know. Um, Okay, well, uh, Mr. Whelan, uh, I just want to give you a shout out. I know Director Pena got cut off and the Illegal Dumping Partnership, um, especially here on the West Side, you know, we've had a lot of illegal dumping because we have so much construction going out on out here. And um, it's, it's, it's been a problem in my district. I think Councillor Senna has experienced it. Councilor Pena surely has experienced it and we thank you for your efforts regarding that. I, I, I just have to say that you're pretty amazing. I mean, um, I asked the question last time about dumping at the, um, at the transfer stations and the, and the fees. And I know that those fees are still pretty, pretty much the same as they've always been even during COVID. And, you know, I, I, I'm pointing that out because I know that during COVID, there was quite a bit more dumping and, you know, people were cleaning out their garages or whatever. I mean, their backyards, um, their sheds. And um, I know that you experienced a higher volume at that time, but, you know, just thank you for not raising our fees regarding, uh, so the, the question that I do have is with regard to the new facility on the west side. Um, can you give us any uh, indication regarding the timing of that or what you're anticipating? Uh, thank you, Councilor President. That should be done by December of this year. They've already been working on it. And uh, you'll see coming up here shortly within the next probably two to three months, we'll begin our ad campaigns because as we split the, once the West Side facility becomes available to us, we're shooting to be in there by January 1 of 2022. What's gonna happen is everybody's day is gonna change. And that's something that hasn't happened in probably 15, 20 years. So we're gonna be changing everybody's day because the West Side will now have Monday to Friday routes and the East Side will continue to have Monday through Friday routes, Friday routes, but but currently right now we pick up the east side Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the west side Thursday, Friday. Now they'll both be picked up five days a week on their respective sides. So once the facility is done this year, we're going to be doing that. So it's going to, it's going to be a heavy lift, but we're, we're ready to do it. And we're ready to get the word out and get it to everybody so that um, everybody's going to have a new trash day. And how would you be announcing that just so people know and, and the customers know uh, we, uh, Council President, thank you for asking that question. We've actually brought on um, a consultant to work with us on, on the marketing end, and we're going to do it through several, several different avenues. I mean, we're going to have mailers to everybody. We're going to have not just your traditional radio and TV spots. We're looking at what it's going to what it's going to cost us to get um, maybe temps or use uh, students at UNM that want to work part time to literally canvas neighborhoods with material to let people know what's going on. So we're, we're looking at all these different avenues of how we're going to get the word out to everybody. Okay. Um, and so one, one kind of last question is, I know that you're having a cleanup day coming up. Um, would you like to just say, say something about that? Because that's a really important um, 
you know, it's really important. And I know you've been doing it by quadrants. Um, so could you just mention that, please? Absolutely. Council President, um, thanks for letting us, us plug this. We are going into week three of our four week one Albuquerque cleanup month. And just to, just to show you what, what we've done, our first week we had over um, 20, was it 13 tons, which equivalent was like 23,000 pounds. And that's the quadrant we did in the Southeast with the, at Phil Chacon Park. So we had an extremely successful event there. Last Saturday, we were at North Domingo Baca and I think we were right around a little bit less, but um, the numbers are still coming in. And this Saturday, we will be at Tower Pond Park uh, in, the Southwest and we'll be there from eight to 12. We have volunteers all signed up, ready to go. And we'll be going into the neighborhoods to just do a really good cleaning. And then our last one will be in the, um, in the Southwest and the last quadrant will be at Alamosa Basin Park, which is over up by Taylor Ranch. But that one will have two locations. We'll have that location, but then we'll also open up our Edith location where we currently are for people that are closer to our Edith location. And that'll be wrapping up our month-long cleanup on the 15th. And that that particular one is next weekend, correct? Yes. This this Saturday we will be is at- that, That's my district. So I'm just, I'm trying to track it, but oh. thank you. Um, so I just want to also, I mean, there, there are a lot of employees that were working during COVID. And I know the solid waste drivers were definitely the guys that were out there and gals. And, you know, we were dependent on them and uh, just a shout out to them. And thank you, Director Whelan, for everything that, that you guys do. Thank you, Council President. Okay, Mr. Davis, we will move on. I think um, this is our last department. You are correct, Madam President. Last but, but not least, least right? <laughs> you got it. Director Danny Holcomb, FY22 proposed operating budget of 49 million, 508 positions. The proposed budget includes a general fund subsidy reduction of 1.9 million that will be covered by FTA CARES funding. And as you know, this is a net uh, subsidy reduction. So um, last year we used about 6.3 million. This year we're gonna use about 8.7 million. Um, it doesn't exactly equal or reconcile because there are multiple factors of increase and decrease in budget. Uh, next item is 2.8 million is added for a transfer to the transit capital fund 665. Next is 632,000 for 10 positions included for additional security on routes across the city. And last we got 191,000 is included to support overtime for the two additional holidays. And Director Holcomb does have two slides, Madam President. Good afternoon, Director Holcomb. Good afternoon, uh, Council President. Thank you for allowing me a couple minutes to talk. Um, first and foremost, I want, I want to talk and uh, kind of brag about our new electric bus that we have on the streets right now. We're excited that we're going to be getting five more buses this year, um, five more electric buses this year. So we're excited about those. Um, we're trying the new electric bus on various routes throughout town to see where it performs best. It's been on Central. And now we have it on the Route 31 Wyoming route. We're going to just roll it out to different routes and see what kind of results we can get in different areas of town. So we're excited about that new electric bus that we have in. Next slide. Um, our art safety, uh, $632,000 is added to increase security along the Central Corridor corridor and adding 10 full-time employees. And I'm sure I'm probably going to get a, president, a question from Councillor Senna since she asked a question earlier. Um, our COVID-19 response, as you all know, we've been continuing to ride, uh, provide service throughout Albuquerque. Um, it's not just a city requirement, but it's now actually now a federal requirement. The masks are required on all buses, sun vans, and uh, transit facilities. And to date, we've handed out over 70,000 masks to, to folks who are getting on our buses. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to do that. Um, we're going to continue to do that all throughout, throughout the duration of this uh, pandemic. We have increased uh, cleaning and sanitation on all of our buses, our sun vans, and all of our facilities. Um, we're excited that we're trying to do everything that we can to try and keep uh, not just the public safe, but our drivers safe as well. Our driver recruitment, um, we have ads out on uh, social media. We have ads out on TV stations. We have ads out on one of our buses. And we also have some ads out in, our, uh, in some national and, and, local and uh, regional publications to try and recruit some drivers. Um, we're, we're trying as hard as we can to get as many drivers in as quickly as we can because we know we have a need for them. Um, we have uh, 11, 
one of the things we want to try this year is we're going to try and see if we can re recruit some part-time drivers, uh, motor cruiser operators and sun van drivers. Um, we have a lot of our, our, our routes or shift work where the drivers may come in for a few hours in the morning or a few hours in the afternoon. And that might be an opportunity for us to try and recruit some drivers to uh, come in for a few hours and, and uh, provide service along those routes. So those are the things we're looking forward to and I will stand for questions. Are there questions of Mr. Holcomb? Yes, Madam President, I've raised my hand. Councilor Jones, I do see your hand raised. Thank you, I just raised it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Director Holcomb, I, I am pleased to hear that we're added, we have added more electric buses. Could you tell me please who the provider from whom we purchased the electric buses? Council President and Councilor Jones, uh, the provider is gonna be Proterra. It's a national firm that's used in several cities across the country. And those are, that's the bus that's here now, and those are the five buses that we're going to be getting in, uh, hopefully by November. And where is that uh, bus provider located? I think they're in Indiana, Councillor. All right. Thank you. Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Director Holcomb, just a quick one. Um, so the additional uh, security on Central Corridor, is that 10 FDs? plus uh, contract security, or is that the, ten, how does that break down? Council President, Councilor Benton, our hope is that once we hire these, these 10 FTEs, those will replace contract security. Okay. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're having all this discussion too about uh, possibly, uh, you know, going to, to free fares. I know that's not in the budget this time around, but something that counselors have been interested in. And I, I think I made the point that it's not only uh, about um, crunching those numbers, but um, but the security is a critical piece of that too, if we go to free passes or, or no passes at all. Um, the only other question I had, um, Get to it here. I'm sorry. I guess that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of the counselors? Um, I just wanted to mention uh, Director Holcomb. Uh, recently, I um, witnessed uh, one of your um, bus drivers uh, that deals with, um, uh, I guess, special needs um, individuals and senior population. And I just, uh, I don't know if you heard me at the last meeting, but I just wanted to give, um, and I'm trying to find his name here, um, a shout out to your bus drivers that deal with uh, special needs population because they, you know, I was sitting in a, in a place where I was able to witness um, just the patience of this individual. And I'll send you the name. I don't have it with me right in front of me, but um, you know, the training and the sensitivity um, was just really, really stellar. And I just, I went, I, I walked out and, and thanked them for that because this person was uh, handicapped and just the time that, that he took with this individual was um, just stellar. But the one question that I wanted to ask you was with regard, and I raised this issue before, a lot of our seniors have problems getting to their doctor's appointments, you know, and they have over with COVID because no, they don't always have reliable transportation. So I just wanna make sure that, that we are, um, you know, that we do prioritize um, our seniors and, and um, just make sure that, you know, if there's any way we can give them free bus rides or anything in the future, working with the Office of Senior Affairs, I would absolutely support that. Council President, uh, the driver, first of all, the driver was Stephen Morgan. I got, I remember that from Stephen the last Stephen Morgan, week. yes, thank you so, so thank much. Thank you for that. I and knew it was Stephen, but I couldn't remember his last name. Yes, ma'am. And then actually, we're actually doing free fares for seniors 60 and over. That was something that was implemented uh, a few months back. So we're excited that we are 
offering free uh, uh, bus and van transportation for seniors 60 and over. That's one of the demographics that we are uh, serving. With, I, I just want to thank you for that because I had raised that during COVID and for you to have actually done that and, and followed through with that, I so much appreciate you for doing that. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors? I don't see any hands raised. So with that, thank you, Mr. Holcomb for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Mr. Davis, I'll go back to you. Thank you, Madam President. That concludes our presentation. Um, we'll stand for any questions, if you have any. Other than that, thank you for your time tonight, counselors. Are there any questions of Mr. Holcomb, of Mr. Davis? Apparently not. Thank you, that was a very, great presentation from all of our directors. Um, I'm going to make some motions. Uh, we're gonna go back to our agenda for the public's sake and so that they know where we are. Um, we are on R147 and I will move deferral to the May 13th meeting. Councilor Senna, thank you for that second. Uh, Ms. Matoya, we'll need a vote regarding that. Absolutely. Councillor Basson? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Councillor Gibson? Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. And I don't believe Councillor Pena is back. So that is at a 6-0 vote. Thank you, counselors. Um, my dog has decided that she wants to bark. So if you hear that in the background, you'll know what that is. Um, so we are going to move on to R157. And um, I am going to move deferral of R157 to the May 13th agenda. I'll second that. Councillor Jones, thank you for that second. Any questions? If not, uh, Ms. Montoya. Sure, and we are on R157, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. And that passes on a 6 0 vote. Uh, excuse me, Madam, Madam President, just uh, um, i sorry to interrupt. I think we skipped over R148. If we can go back to the vote oh. on the objectives bill. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I scrolled too fast on my computer. Um, so we will go back, Councillor, to item B which is R158, and that is establishing our one-year objectives. And I will move deferral to the May 13th hearing. I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Any comments or questions? If not, Ms. Montoya, would you call for the vote? Councillor Brisson? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. And Councillor Borrego? Yes. And that Thank passes you. on a 6 0 vote. Thank you, Ms. Montoya. That passes on a 6 0 vote. Um, so then, uh, if I'm correct in the order, we will move on to item number D, which is 050. And uh, this is Council, Councilors Davis and Benton. Uh, Councilors, would you like to make a motion? Madam Chair, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I would like to move a deferral of uh, 050 until uh, May 13th. Uh, to thank the you, home. Councilor, and I'll second that. So are there any questions or comments from any Councilors? 
Seeing none, Ms. Montoya, would you take the roll call? Councillor Besson? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Councillor Gibson? Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Senna? Yes. Councillor Borrego? Yes. And that passes on a 6 0 vote. Thank you, councillors. We have uh, much business to attend to at our next meeting. Uh, being no further business, this committee of the whole meeting is adjourned.